everybody. It's good to have you back at Mesa Baptist Church on a Wednesday night for our midweek Bible study and prayer time. Good to have the teens back in here again this evening as Savannah is back home with Dominic with the baby. And so looking forward to having them as part of our service tonight. Let's begin this evening's service number 353. Let's all stand if we can. Number 353, singing about our evangelism, bringing in the sheaves. Number 353, all three verses tonight. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the dewy eve. Waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. Shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither cloud nor winter's chilly breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing on this last verse. Going forth with weeping, sowing for the master, though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieve. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Amen. Great song after our Grow Outreach last night. Thanks for singing out. Let's all sing one more song. Number 134, Angels We Have Heard on High, all three verses. Number 134, all three verses, nice and loud together. Why don't you sort of wave to somebody? Don't shake anybody's hand tonight. There's a lot of sickness going around, and so I want to make sure you keep your germs to yourself. And so wave to somebody. Give someone the peace sign if you want to. Thanks for being in church tonight. And then once you waved and said peace to somebody, why don't you be seated? Just to, 
Just a quick, uh, people are waving and Mrs. Tishy's over there insulting everybody. Okay, that's, that's nice. All right, just a couple quick announcements as we continue with our service. Looking forward to having a good Sunday this coming Sunday on the 10th. And uh, that being, begins really the week of a lot of our activities here at the church. We have our Christmas party. Uh, that's a, uh, on the 15th of next week. So not this coming Friday, but next Friday. And so really you have tonight and next Sunday, this coming Sunday, to sign up. So if you have not yet signed up for a Christmas party, uh, please get an invite ticket from the lobby. Put the number of attendees from your family or friends on that ticket and turn it into myself or Cheryl or put it in the offering plate on Sunday. We'll have enough food for you. Uh, last time we checked, we had almost 120 signed up. And so looking forward to having a few more come on Sunday. I think we'll have a good number in here. It'll be a lot of fun that night. So we're going to have a good menu. Uh, we're going to have turkey and ham dinner as well as stuffing, green beans, mashed potatoes, and then uh, you're bringing the dessert. So if you'd like to bring a dessert, there's a sign-up sheet available in the lobby. You can bring any kind of dessert you'd like. Just put your name and your dessert type on there. And then um, Valerie, you're making, what was it called? Um, natillas. natillas. I asked somebody what they were, and they said, whatever it is, it's super good. So I can't wait. So you have to make a little extra for me, all right? Because I was... I was like, I wasn't say stalking. I was looking to see who signed up and uh, what everybody's bringing for dessert so I can prepare. How much food do I have to eat that night? Depending on how much dessert there is, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, I looked around, some asked them, and said they're really, really good. I'm so looking forward to having that. And so if you'd like to help bring some desserts as well, we got plenty of available spots for that. And so the, the sign up sheet's available in the lobby. And so make sure you sign up for that this evening. And then, of course, the 17th is our uh, Faith and Flannel Sunday. And the evening service is our wheelbarrows of candy. The week after that is uh, candlelight service. And so a lot of fun things coming up. Make sure you have someone with you if you can. And as we've been saying over the past few weeks, maybe intentionally decide on what, what service you're going to try to have somebody attend and really uh, gear that person for that service. Instead of having a general try and invite somebody to something, um, say, I'm going to try to invite my neighbors to the candlelight service or my co-workers to the Christmas party and I'll... Uh, Maybe God will help bless you when you have that intentional focus on evangelism. And so uh, looking forward to seeing a good number of people here for that. And Lord willing, we can see some people saved um, this coming weekend. Uh, it's been a good summer. We had a handful of people saved this past summer. They're going through discipleship material. Mac is actually getting baptized on Sunday. As so was uh, Rene Gallegos. And so uh, it's going to be a good Sunday for that. And uh, so looking forward to seeing hopefully some more people saved um, this coming Christmas season. All right. Also... The ladies are having an ensemble practice tonight right after church. And so all the ladies and girls are invited to join Mrs. Carr and the ladies ensemble up here in the choir loft right after church service. You're going to go over a beautiful star of Bethlehem and uh, Bethlehem. And uh, looking forward to having uh, that beautiful song on Sunday. All right. I think that's it. So let's take out our prayer time and missions letter. The Creeches are our missionaries of the week. They're in Panama. And I love the Creeches letter because his wife adds a special note from herself so it's always nice to get uh, the wife's perspective on ministry and some ways we can pray for her and the family. And so if you can pray for the creatures faithfully this week, I know they'll appreciate that. And then uh, let me give you a few additional prayer requests, and then we'll take some additional ones this evening. Um, as you're praying for the creatures tonight, if you could add Miss Leah Vesley to the prayer list. She's, been not, been, she's not been feeling very well over the past few weeks and uh, some uh, different pains and she's not been sleeping very well. And so she asked our church if we would pray for her. And so let's pray for Miss Leah Vesley. She'll appreciate that. And then um, Gloria Kane asked if we'd pray for her friend, Jamie. Um, she's having some health issues. They're not sure what's wrong. So if we could pray for Jamie, that's Gloria's friend, um, that they can figure that out um, with her. All right. And I think that's it. So Alex, if you don't mind coming forward tonight and taking up some additional prayer requests and praises, thank you. Appreciate it. And now let's start over here, Alex. All right. And so any additional prayer requests or praises on the far right side of the auditorium? Any additional prayer requests or praises? All right. How about the center section here? All right, Brother Tim. Yeah, I'd like to ask you guys to pray for my best friend, Chris. His mother-in-law passed away this past weekend, so his wife uh, flew back to Japan for mm -hmm. the funeral. So just pray for him. All right, pray for Chris and the family. Anyone else in this section here? All right, how about the center section right over here? Any additional prayer requests or praises? All right, Miss Lori. 
Um, Mike is not feeling well today. On top of all the pain and everything, he's not feeling well. Um, so pray for him for that. He's under the weather. Okay. Pray for that. Anyone else on this section here? All right, how about the far left section over here? Our brother Joe. If you could just pray for my mom. She's got COVID, yeah. finally, for the first time. So <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's doing okay. She's got a lot of hacking and coughing and sore ribs. We'll pray for her. Amen. Anyone else in this far left section here? All right, if that's it, Alex, light night for you. Appreciate you helping out this evening. And so as always, let's pray for our church. And uh, we're focusing on uh, different characters of Christmas on Sunday morning. And uh, pray that can be a practical, uh, helpful series. And then pray for our services so that we can uh, have the gospel preached in a very clear way for our guests. All right. If that's it, uh, you can put your uh, prayer times away. Stand and sing one more song, number 446. Number 446, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. All three verses tonight as we stand and sing, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms leading on jesus christ my savior safe and secure from all alarms leading 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 on the everlasting arms oh how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leading on the everlasting arms the path grows from day to day, leading on the everlasting arms, leading, leading, safe and secure from all alarms, leading on Jesus, leading on Jesus, leading on the everlasting arm. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? everlasting arms I have blessedness with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arms leaning on Jesus Christ my Savior safe and secure from all alarms leaning 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 on the everlasting arms Amen. Great singing tonight. You may be seated. And as you're being seated, let's find our place in 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. Uh, just like last week, it's good to have the teens in here uh, with us in our service. Uh, please continue to pray for Savannah and the baby. Dominic, I talked to him or texted him this afternoon, and uh, they're both doing well, Savannah and Ember. And uh, so please continue to pray for them, especially during cold and flu season, that everybody stays healthy there in the McClure home. And we miss them when they're not here, and so please continue to pray for them. But uh, the blessing is, even though they're not here, we get the teens with us. And so it's good to have the teens in the service with us. And the teens will probably recognize this portion of Scripture this evening as we continue our series through the book of 1 John. Matter of fact, uh, if you've been raised in church, this is probably one of the first group of verses you memorized when you were a child or a teenager. Uh, I can't remember a time when I did not know these verses uh, because when I was raised in church um, in Patch Club, in Sunday school, uh, in, uh, I think, kindergarten and Christian school, and then I went to public school after that. I uh, went back to Christian school in, like, eighth grade. Uh, but we learned it in Bible class. And so if you grew up in church, you probably memorized these verses. If you've gone to teen camp, you probably memorized these verses. And if you've been here at Mason Baptist Church for any length of time, you've probably heard these verses um, at least referenced to or preached from. And so they're very popular, very familiar, very famous verses. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to read these three verses together as a church family. So I'll read the reference, and then we'll read these verses out loud together as a congregation. All right, so we're in 1 John 
2, 15 through 17, so you can make your place. And if you have it memorized, you can try to say it without looking down, okay? So 1 John 2, 15 through 17, let's begin. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. First John 2, 15 through 17, a very familiar portion of Scripture. And if you were here last week, you remember that the context of these verses is not really for brand new Christians. Hey, you just got saved. You just started your walk with the Lord. Let me give you some counsel. Love not the world. No, really the context is for those who are maturing and growing in their faith. If you remember last week, we looked at those little children, then young men, and then fathers. Little children because they've, uh, they know the Father and their sins are forgiven. Young men because you're strong and the word of God abideth in you and you overcome the wicked one. And fathers because you have known him that's from the beginning. And so we see a progression in the Christian life and those who are warring, those who are strong in the Lord, those who allow the word of God to abide in them are those who are loving God and not the world. They're the ones who are serving the things of God and serving eternity and not the temporal things of this life. And so the context of these very famous verses is that of spiritual maturity and spiritual victory. And so these verses are for everybody and every walk of their Christian life. Now, obviously, when you look at verse 15 and it starts out with love, not the world, that's a reminder for us as Christians that there is a kind of love that God hates. A lot of people think about Christianity as the, as the religion of love, and it is because God loved the world. We are to love one another. We are to treat people the way we want ourselves to be treated. That's the golden rule, right? And so the Christianity is a, a, a religion, if we can use that word, that focuses on loving others and putting others before us. But the Bible kind of puts a line in the sand and saying, yes, we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes, we love others because we share the gospel with them, we serve them. Yes, there's a kind of love that God ex expects us to emulate, but there's also a kind of love that God hates. And that's when the Christian has a desire for and a heart for the world. The kind of love that God hates, Christians also must learn to hate. If there is a love that God hates, then as Christians we must love what God loves and hate what God hates. We must love God, we must love Christ, we must love the Bible, we must love truth, we must love people, but also in turn, we must also learn to hate sin. We must learn to hate unrighteousness. We must learn to hate the world and the things that are in the world. So these verses are not just for the newly saved, they are for all of us this evening who are seeking to be like Christ and to mature in their faith. And so let's pull these three verses apart as we see what God has for us tonight. First John chapter 2, then verse 15, John tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, maybe when you think about that on the surface, something doesn't quite ring appropriate. Love not the world. Isn't there a verse that says that God loves the world? In John 3.16, John 3 is saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Then so God loved the world, but now we as Christians are told, hey, but we don't love the world. So what's going on? How come God can do it and we can't do it? Is it the same? Well, let me answer that question for you. Really, there are four general kinds of worlds that we find in the word of God. One commentator says there are 10 ways this word cosmos is used throughout the New Testament. We're not gonna get all 10 of those, but there are 10 general kinds of worlds that are found in the Bible. Number one is the created world. It's okay for us to show affection and, and take care of that. God's not saying hate your planet, all right? Uh, he's not saying that. Uh, there's this created world that God has made for us to enjoy. And so this is not a command to hate the planet. There's also the people of the world, which is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that's the people of the world, and we are most definitely supposed to love everyone that is in the world. It doesn't matter their skin color. 
doesn't matter their ethnicity. If they have a soul, we as Christians are to demonstrate God's love to them and for them. And so there's the created world, then there's the people of the world, and so those are the kinds of worlds that it's not bad for us to show affection for and to not hate. But then there are two also worlds in the Bible that we are, as Christians, to hate. Number one is the age, this worldly age, this world of time that we live in. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, For Demoth hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. The Apostle Paul was traveling with a group of men, and they were starting churches. Demas was one of those men that were traveling with Paul, and he's mentioned in several different passages of Scripture. And the last passage read about him, Demas leaves the work of God, in the verse we just read, because he loved this present world. The word there in world, Demas hath left me, or Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, that's not the same world as we have in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2, this word cosmos, which is the world system. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. This is the world we really get the word eon from, an age. And so Demas left the work of God because he loved this present world, this present time, this present age. And so he was living more for the things of this life than for eternity. And he wanted the things of this world more than he wanted the things of eternity. And so the Bible tells us to hate that kind of worldliness that focuses on the temporal and not the eternal. It focuses on the fleshly and not the spiritual. And then we see in 1 John 2 and verse 15, the fourth kind of general world, which is cosmos. We get the word cosmetics from um, that, which is, well, we won't get into that. Um, cosmetics uh, appearing well and appearing nice. Um, and that is really the philosophy and the system of the world. So John is saying specifically here, love not the system and the philosophy of this world. Not don't love the people of the world. We are to do that, John 3.16. John says don't love the philosophies and the systems that this world has set up. There's a system in this world that is anti-God. It's anti-Christ. It's anti-family. It's anti-purity. It's run by secular humanism. It's run by a worldly thinking. And all of this makes it utterly hostile towards Christianity and the Lord. That's why Romans 12 and verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world. Don't be conformed in your thinking and in your life to this system that is opposed to the things of God. You want to see if the world really is opposed to the things of God? Just go, go in the mall and start quoting Scripture. And see what people start doing. They'll, they'll, they'll probably ask you to leave and, and stop uh, disrupting the public or whatever it might be. Because there's a system that is against God. Now, why is this system against God? Why, why is this world, in a way, against God? Well, because it's run by the devil. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shine unto them. And so this is a, a, a terrible system because it's run by, and um, the architect of it is, the devil. This is why James 4.4, 4, James says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's a connecting point that verse to the end of verse 15 when it says that if you love these things, the love of the Father is not in him. If there is one who loves the world and who loves this system that is opposed to God and opposed to Scripture and is orchestrated by the devil, one who is a friend of that is an enemy of God because they are in the world and they are not in Christ. And so the Bible tells us as Christians, we must guard our hearts so we do not set up as important the things that want to entangle us and keep our hearts in this time and in this world. The Bible says, love not the world and don't love the things in the world. Now that is not saying, the things in the world is the next verse. It's not saying you cannot have the things of this world. It is saying, don't let the things of this world have you. There are a lot of things that this world has that we can't enjoy, right? I mean, there's 
wood in this pulpit, very hard wood in this pulpit, solid wood in this pulpit, okay? And uh, it's okay for us to use this pulpit, right? Because it's this pulpit, this sacred desk that we use to proclaim and preach the word of God. So it's okay to use the wood that the world has. You, your house probably has wood in it. You use wood to, to uh, put a structure around your family. Maybe if you have a wood-burning stove in your house, you use wood to stay warm. You use wood to cook your food so you can eat. We use wood to preach from. Uh, we have wood here in this building here. We use it to, to use this building to, to propagate the gospel. And so having the things of this world is not necessarily a bad thing, but when you allow the things of this world to have you, then they become a bad thing because it takes your focus off of God. Now, specifically, love not the world neither things that are in the world, what are those things? That's verse 16, we'll get to in just a moment. And so the Bible says to love not the world, don't love this system that's against God, don't love anything associated and entangled in this system. And the reason is, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now that's a very, that's a strong line of demarcation, isn't it? If you love the world, then the love of God is not in you. Now, there's a lot of teenagers, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of churches that want to blur this idea that, no, you can love the things of the world and you can love God because, hey, how can you share the love of God? Well, by being part of the world. Listen, that's a very dangerous place to live. The Bible says love, don't give your affection, don't serve, don't be a part of, don't give your heart to the things of this world. Now, when you have a teenager and an adult and a parent or a, a church member when they are engrossed and obsessed with the things of this world and the money and the popularity and the desires and the prideful. When they love this world, the Bible says that person is not saved. How can John say something so harsh? Well, he's repeating kind of what Jesus said. You can't serve two masters. If you say... I love the Lord, then you are going to hate the world. If you're going to say, I love the world, then you cannot love Christ also. You cannot serve God and mammon. No, no man can serve two masters. Your heart will belong to one. Either you will love the one and hate the other, or, or hold the one and despise the other. But you can't serve two. And so if you're serving the things of this world, then the love of the Father is not in there. That's why it's so hard for you to live the Christian life. That's why it's so hard for you to give your heart to things of God, because God's not in your heart, because your desires and your, your thinking is only for the things of this world and the temporal things of this world. The Bible says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, as Christians, we cannot live apart from the world. We have to live in the world. That's the system. We can't go to heaven, so we have to be here. And I would encourage you to read John chapter 17. We don't have time to do that tonight, but specifically verses 13 through 19, Jesus says, listen, I know that you as my followers, you as Christians are going to be in the world. I'm not praying that God takes you out of the world, but I am praying that God keeps you from the evil that is in the world. And that's where the key to the Christian life lies. Not an isolation, but an insulation. God's not trying to take us out of the world. We have to be witness in the world, but we should be isolated and insulated from the things of the world. For example, when you buy a boat, I don't know why you'd buy one in New Mexico, but if you buy a boat, all right, and you say, man, look at this great 19 and a half foot citation ski boat. That's what we had growing up. And so look at this beautiful boat. It's a phenomenal boat. It's, it's on this really nice uh, trailer. It's, it's, it's waxed. It's, it's good, 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 good coloring. Inboard, outboard, board motor. Comes with skis. A beautiful boat. Wow, amazing. That's great. But when it's sitting in the side yard of your house, it's not doing anything, is it? It's still a boat, but it's, that's not the purpose for it. It's not to be sitting on the side of your house getting sun damaged, right? It's made to be in the water. And so you take that boat, and then you put it in the water. Now, it's where it's supposed to be. As long as the boat is in the water, and the water is not in the boat, right? That's, that's the key to good boating, all right? Keep the water out, all right? So the boat is in the water, 
but the water should not be in the boat. Now, as a Christian, we are in the world, but the world is not to be in us. You're the boat in the illustration, okay? And so God created you to be in the world. He saved you. He gave you his Holy Spirit. He's given you his word. He's given you his direction so that you can be safely in this world protected. And so the key for you to live this life is to advance and progress your faith in this world. You are in the water. Now the key is to keep the water out of you. So love not the world. It would be pretty silly if you were canoeing saying, man, this water is so clear. Let's get some in the boat, right? And then you get a big, big bucket of water put it in your canoe. That'd be pretty stupid, wouldn't it? But that's kind of what you do in the Christian life when you are so attracted to the things of the world that you allow them into your life and in your family. It's going to be done to your detriment. And so the Bible says, love not the world. This system that is opposed to the things of God, this system that is against God and against Christ and against the Bible, against truth, against purity, against the things in the word of God, this system, don't give your heart to this world. Now we can see if someone's a Christian by how they live. Do they live for the things of this world? If they do live for the things of this world, the Bible says the love of the Father is not in them. But if we do have love of the Father, we are in the world but not of the world. And we should live our lives keeping the world out, which takes us to verse 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now notice in this verse, we're going to pull it apart here in a moment, there was the lust of the flesh, then that, that conjunction, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not just saying there's another one in the list, like a comma. It's saying that these three all work together to bring your heart into the world. There's the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All these three things are working together to bring your heart and your mind into this world. It says in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. What is the lust of the flesh? The world wants to capture us, control us, and corrupt us. And it will seek any angle into our heart by using these three deadly forces. The first is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is the intense desires that the old man is tempted to fulfill. Our old man is kept at bay by our obedience to the Holy Spirit. But even though we're saved, we still have this natural man inside of us that's warring against the new man. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 and 17, it deals a little bit about this lust of the flesh and the, lust and, and the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, the Apostle Paul says, This I say then. So he's getting our attention. Now listen to this. This I say then, walk in the Spirit... And ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Because there's a desire inside of us, the old man, to fulfill its own desires. The things that you want. Doesn't care, does, who cares what your spouse wants? What do you want? Who cares what your children want? What do you want? Who cares what the Bible says? How do you feel? Then do that. That's the lust of the flesh. What does your flesh want? What does your old man, what does that natural man want? And the Bible says to, to, to kind of combat that, walk in the Spirit. Now, if you follow the Holy Spirit, you're not going to follow the lusts of the flesh. And it says in the very next verse, in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The word lust is an intense desire for. It's not always a sensual thing. That's how it is in our society. We talk about lust. It goes to sensuality and sexuality. But when the Bible says the flesh lusteth against the spirit, that means the the flesh has an intense desire to be against the spirit. They are completely contrary one to another. There is is no love lost between the two. They They are mortal enemies. They are complete hatred because one is light and one is darkness. One is righteous, one is unrighteous. One is spirit, 
the other is flesh. And so there's an intense desire to take the other one down. And the Bible says there's this lust of the flesh in us that's always desiring for the things of this world. It's always wanting what this world has to offer. I think it was Spurgeon that said, when you look at church history, nothing destroys Christianity more than prosperity. Or something along those lines. Christianity can, can make it through persecution. Christianity can survive uh, difficult times. But Christians cannot survive prosperity. Because that's what our flesh wants. We want it. And the Bible says that the world and the devil is going to use the lusts in the flesh to pull you into the world itself. So what's in the world? The lust of the flesh. In conjunction with and the lust of the eyes. The eyes are the key to what is triggering the flesh. What you set before your eyes now has an entry point into your flesh and into your heart. Like when you, uh, when you go fishing, right? Uh, now, I, I assume this is right because I'm not much of a fisherman, okay? But when you, when you throw that, that bait, that lure that's been baited in the water, you don't try to put that, you don't try to throw it onto a fish, right? And, and snag the fin of that fish. No, you throw that bait and that lure in there to attract the fish, right? And so as that fish is thinking, man, it was a tough day today, man. I sure am hungry. All of a sudden it sees, bing, oh man, what is that sparkly worm doing over there? Just floating in the middle of the water. I'm hungry now. And so the eyes sees the bait and then it goes after the lure. And that's kind of what the lust of the eyes do to the flesh. We're living our Christian life kind of, uh, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, right? Just living our Christian life. And all of a sudden, our eyes see the things of this world. And now our attention's been stopped. And now it's on the things of this world. And now we're attracted to things of the world. And so that's kind of how they work together. Our eyes see it. And then our flesh wants it. And the devil understands exactly what he's doing. Matter of fact, he used this in the Garden of Eden to get Adam and Eve to fall. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, or in Genesis chapter 3, that God told them, hey, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And so they had that knowledge. They knew that tree is bad not to eat it. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. We can see really the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in that verse. But what was it that got her attracted to it when she saw it? And then that it was pleasant to the eyes. It doesn't, it doesn't look deadly. We don't know if it was an apple or not, but let's say it was an apple. You know, hmm, it looks kind of shiny. It doesn't look like it would cause death. It doesn't look like it would, it would cast all of humanity into damnation. It looks like fruit. I mean, it was the lust of the eyes that caught her attention. And then her heart was drawn to it. We see this over and over throughout Scripture. 2 Samuel 11, verse 2, when David was supposed to be at war, before he committed sin with Bathsheba, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 11, and verse 2, And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. How did he know she was beautiful to look upon? Because he was looking upon her. He went up on the roof and he saw it. Now he could have just turned away and went back inside and got on his horse and went to war and it could have been okay. But when he saw her and then he made that second look and saw that she was beautiful to look upon, that's when he wanted her. It was the lust of the flesh that drew in, the lust of the eyes that drew in the lust of the flesh. In Joshua 7 and verse 21, Achan said, when I saw among the spoils of the goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. I didn't want them until I saw them. It was the lust of the eyes that drew in the lust of the flesh. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 10, Solomon says, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. It was what their eyes saw. And so the devil will get you attracted. He'll get your attention. And then he'll pull you in. And so we have the lust of the flesh. 
the lust of the eyes and in conjunction with the pride of life. Okay, we have a little fish swimming, going home after a long day's work. And all of a sudden, it sees a worm hanging out in the middle of the water. Doesn't know it's a baited hook. So it's got its attention. Oh, there's a worm there. Now, hmm, I'm hungry. I need to eat that. I deserve that. If I don't eat it, some other fish will. So I better get it before somebody else does. And then it goes after the hook. That would be the pride of life. The world gets our attention. And then, hmm, why would I do that? Why would I fulfill the lust of that flesh? Well, because I deserve it. I've been a pretty good Christian kid so far. If, I can, if I've been doing all this good today, maybe got to overlook those sins. And so we have this pride of life, which is a desire to be self-inflated. What we see, we want, because if I just had this, then I would be happy. If I could just do that, then I would be accepted. If I could just experience that, then I would be better. If I could just have that or do that or know that or be this, I could be higher. And that's the pride of life. And so the world has the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life warring inside of us to get us into the things of this world. Now listen, the Bible says in that verse, in verse 16, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, look at the rest of the verse, it's not of God, but is of the world. That means that none of these desires, the flesh, the eyes, the pride, none of these desires come from God, nor are they satisfied by God. Which reminds us that so much of the Christian life involves self-denial. There are desires in the flesh. There are attractions to the eye. There are feelings in the self that we must say no to because they're of the world. They're not of God. These desires want to be met through the things of this world. And John reminds us, listen, no, there is a much more satisfying end for the Christian. So say no to the flesh. No to the attraction in the world. No to the pride of life. So that you can be filled with the Spirit. And live the Holy Spirit-filled Christian life. So these desires in us should not be fulfilled by the things of this world. The Christian life really is a life of self-denial. Listen, teenagers, you've got to learn to say no to self. You've got to learn to say no to the things of this world. There are temptations that they appear attractive. They, they seem innocent. But if it's not of God, then it's of the world. And if it's of, and it's of, and if it's of the world, we have to learn to say no. Listen, parents, your Christian life is a life of self-denial. You have to learn to say no. Verse 17. So all that's in the world, less the flesh, less the eyes, pride of life. Listen, it's not of God. It's of the world. So just say no. Verse 17. Why do we say no? Why do we not love the world? Why do we not give our heart and our attention and our affections to the things of this world. Well, verse 17, because the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. A big reason for not living for the world and the things of the, of the world, the things of now, is because these things will not last. The world is the Titanic. It's going down. It's not going to last. It's like sitting down at dinner with a plate full of cotton candy. It looks so big and so satisfying, but really when you experience it, there's nothing there at all. And the Bible says that's the things of the world. It appears so substantial, so lovely, so innocent, so long lasting. But the things of this world are only going to pass away. They're not going to last. When you go to a hotel room, like if you're traveling on vacation and you, and you stay in a hotel, do you redecorate? Probably not. Do you repaint? No. Do you buy new 
window dressings and, and shades and blinds? No. Do you buy a new TV when you go to a hotel room and think so small? No. Why? Because you're not going to stay in there very long. And so you kind of just put up with it so you can get back home to all the things that you like. And the Bible says don't love, don't invest in, don't give your heart to the things of this world. Why? Because we're not staying here very long. Like we sing in the songbook, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And since this place, this world is not going to last, why would we want to give our affections towards it? Why would we want to live in and for the things of this world? They're just going to pass away anyway. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 24 and 25, Peter says this. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. The Bible says that flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as grass. So why would we want to live for the pleasures of others if that's just going to pass away? That's what it's saying. Why would you want to live to be approved by people that will forget you in no time? Uh, I remember, probably just like you, when I was in high school, we're going to be friends forever, right? Friends forever, you know, we're, we're always going to be best friends. I probably couldn't name half the kids I graduated with. I, I, don't keep, I keep in contact with one of the kids I went to high school with. I guess two, but really one. He's a youth pastor in Worcester, Ohio, Brad Weaver. He was uh, here in the area last year, or a couple years ago. All right, he's really the only one. Kids I went to college with, I mean, I got better friends, I guess, um, in college, you know, but you know, a few. The temptation is, hey, I'm going to live my high school years for the, for the joys and to be glorified by all of my peers. And so that's what you live for. And ask every single adult in here, the glory of man fades away. It'd be, it'd be pretty sad to say, yeah, I peaked in high school, right? I was most popular, I was my best self in 11th grade, as, as a senior in high school, I was the best version of myself. That'd be a pretty terrible testimony, wouldn't it? Hopefully you continue to live and grow and mature past that. But that's kind of the mindset of teenagers today. I'm going to live for the things of this world and for the people of now. And so I'm going to, I'm going to live, I'm going to dress, I'm going to be, I'm going to watch, I'm going to do, so that these people here now love me. Hold on. Love not the world. Why did Demas leave? He loved the things of now. He loved the things of this present world. And that's what you're living for. What's going to happen? You will also forsake. You will also live for nothing. Because these things pass away. Why don't we love the world? Why don't we live for the world? Because the world passeth away. And all those lusts pass away as well. What happens for those who live for God? The Bible says, They that do the will of God abideth forever. Are you someone who is guarding your heart against the things of this world while pursuing the things of God? Are you someone who is guarding your heart against the things of this world while pursuing the things of God? Did you know the very last verse in the book of 1 John is echoed in our text tonight? It says the very last verse. I mean, John concludes this amazing book by saying, Little children... Keep yourselves from idols. The word keep there means guard. Little children, there's so much that want to get your attention. There's so many things that want to take your attention away from the things of God. There's so many things that want to get you away from God's will and the things of eternity. There's so many things in this world that want to focus on the things of now. So guard yourself. Keep yourself from those things that want to replace God. The things of God bring value and reward forever. So think about eternity. Think about standing before Christ. Think about the world to come. Now while thinking about eternity, contextualize what you're going through with those eternal lenses. 
children of light, so don't walk in darkness. We are to walk as he walked, so do not sin. The world passes away, so love not the world. Let the things of God drive your priorities. Let the eternal things of God be the motivating force for your life. Don't live for the world. The world passes away. Live for the things of God because those are the things that last forever. Those are the things that are eternal. And if you can live for the things of God, the Bible says, then you can live for eternity. So don't give your heart to things of this world, the things that are temporary. Give your heart to the things of God. Let the things of God drive your priorities, the eternal things of God. So this week, love not the world. Don't love this system. Don't be entertained by this system. Don't give your heart and your affections to this whole system that is completely against God. Guard yourself. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Beware of those three evils. They're going to draw you back into the world, back into your old way of living. No, guard yourself and live for eternity. And if you can do that, that'll be a Christian life that's pleasing to God. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God to help us this week to not love the world, not be driven by the lust of the world, but to live for God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these three verses. And Father, I know they're familiar, but I hope that we can draw a fresh application from them today. And Lord, I pray I'll be with, first of all, the teenagers and children that are in here this evening. I pray that they can decide now that they want to live for eternal things, not for the temporal things that will pass away. What a wasted life to live for things that will pass away. What a wasted life to live for things that are temporal. I mean, even the idea and the wording makes us understand how foolish it is. You don't stand on glass that's breaking. We wouldn't want to walk across ice that's breaking. So we don't want to live for a world that's passing away because it's not going to last. So, Father, help the children and teens tonight to get their eyes on and hearts on eternal things things that will last forever, because then they can influence their friends. Then they can live for eternity and have rewards in heaven. Father, help all of us adults that we cannot think we are so spiritually mature that we don't need a message like this, because we still have the lust of the flesh in us. And the lust of the flesh is still attracted by the things that the lust of the eyes bring our way. And there's a lot of times, if we're honest, there's a pride of life that says we deserve it. What we see in this world, we deserve, and so we fulfill those lusts. What we see in this world, we feel we can handle or we can take care of and not be affected by, and so we fulfill those lusts of the flesh. Father, help us keep our hearts and to guard our hearts and to purify our minds. Father, help us tonight not to love the world, but help us live for eternity. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I appreciate you being here tonight. I appreciate your attention, most of your attention this evening, and I appreciate uh, the time. It's good having the teens in here. Let's take about 10 minutes um, this evening and ask the Holy Spirit um, to guide our, our preaching on Sunday. Let's ask the, the Lord to bless our services on Sunday. Um, we got good services, a lot of activities on Sunday. I uh, got a couple baptisms, which is always a blessing. And so just pray that the preaching and the teaching can be done for the glory of God. And let's pray that we can see guests in our service and we can see them saved. All right. Uh, let's take about 10 minutes. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide our services.
I'll stand one more time tonight. Number 142, the first verse and chorus, really chorus, first verse and chorus. Go tell it on the mountain. Let's all sing nice and loud before I close this reverence in prayer. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. Great singing tonight. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, let's have one final word of prayer, and then we'll see you back here in church on Sunday. We have our Bible fellowship classes at 930, and then main worship service at 1030 and 6 o'clock. And so go invite someone to be your guest this Sunday. Bring them to church with you and let them hear the gospel. We'd love to partner with you and win an end of Christ. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for uh, loving us. I pray that you can help us this week to live for you. Thank you for taking care of our church family. Be with those who are sick and away from us, Father. I pray you can help them to feel better soon. I pray they can watch over them and allow them to uh, make it back to services soon. Uh, we miss those who are out of town and those who are sick. So just um, bring us back together, Father. Thank you for loving us. Please give us a good rest of our night and a good rest of our week. In your sons, let me pray. Amen. All right, ladies, ladies ensemble.